it is week two and a half-ish of fake news. And what we've been doing these past couple weeks, we started on the 31st of December with week zero and week one was last week. But we've been looking at this concept of this. The things you believe is either because you were taught it or you experienced it. That, that's across the board in pretty much every facet of life. What you believe either happened because you were taught it, whether it was by your parents, at school, an educational system, you were taught it, the rules of the road, kind of street smarts, or you experienced it. And the first week we talked about some myths that have kind of crept into the church that we either believe because we were taught it or we experienced it. And some of the myths were this. That activity in the church equals transformation in people's lives. And that's just, it's not true. You can come to church forever, but not be changed by the power of Holy Spirit. Church attendance doesn't equal transformation, right? So that might be a myth that you've thought. Oh, as long as I go to church, I'm, a, I'm okay. Well, that's, that's not true. We also talked about that week that the church exists for me and the church exists for my needs. And then we counteracted that with myth with actually the truth that um, the church is the only entity, it's the only organization that exists for its non-customers. That's why we're here, to reach the lost, the least, the overlooked, people that don't know Jesus. That's why it exists. But then we also talked about, well, wait a minute, isn't the church supposed to be perfect? And I go to church, so shouldn't I be perfect too? Then last week we talked about airplane Christianity. The different classes of Christianity that the church has created, first class, coach class, and the back of the bus class. And it was this, this myth that the better I am, the more Jesus will love me. It's just not true. It's not, that's not true. And if you've bought into that, it, it makes this striving that I need to be perfect to stay in first class or I get kicked out. And that's just not how Jesus works. And so if you miss one of those two teachings, I would encourage you to hop onto our YouTube page and check them out. It unpacks it a bit better. But that's just a quick recap because you believe in something because you were A, taught it, or you B, experienced it. Now, today we're going to shift from the church to ourselves, all right? And so as per usual for this series, we're having a little fun. We're going to have a little bit of mind game, not trivia, but just kind of, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about as we go along. A few years ago, this, this came out. This will give you a little sample. This went kind of viral. And, and the question is, what colors do you see? And I, there's people that I know that see white and gold. And I'm like, are you drunk? Because I don't see that. I see the blue and black. Now, if you see white and gold, I don't want to offend you. I don't see that at all. I think you're crazy that you see white and gold. And you probably think, Dan, you're an idiot because it's blue. It's white and black, not blue and gold. And some of you are like fighting with your spouse right now. I love it. This is, this is healthy. This is healthy fighting. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a little fun with some mind games. Now, when you look at this, this is a woman. She looks attractive upside down. But if you rotate the picture, huh, <laughs> you, your mind plays tricks on you. You're like, Dan, that's, that's not true. It is. I actually, I did it for you to show you. It is, ah, like that is, what is happening? The other upside down, you're like, okay. And then it happens and you're like, this is crazy. This is crazy. Now, mind games. Do you see an hourglass or do you see two faces looking at each other? You can see both. Not everybody sees both, though. What's interesting is the minority see both. The majority can only see one. Now, shake your head fast, and you're going to see a picture. Of you. Don't do it too long. You're going to get concussed. But there is a picture in that. The other night I was going over this, and I was shaking my head. I was like, oh, dizzy. Don't do that too hard. But there's a picture in there. Looks like a yearbook picture from 1974. But you have to shake your head. You don't see it without shaking your head. There's a, there's a lady or a guy, I'm not sure which one, but in there, you got to shake your head. Don, shake your head harder, faster, quicker. <laughs> really embrace it. Mind games. It, it plays tricks on us when you look at it. Pick a dot and stare at it, and the other ones move. Take your eye off the dot to find the moving spinning wheel, and it stops. Now, I have one more for you, and this one's my favorite. What do you see when you look at this picture? You can see both, but you have to change your perspective. If you stare at the eye, he's looking at you. If you stare at the nose, he's looking away from you. It's all about your perspective. Now, here's the thing. 
as you go through these, and this is just for fun, obviously, but as you go through these, what happens sometimes in our thinking is, I'm alone in this. I don't see what they're seeing. I couldn't see that the image, even though I was shaking my head. I couldn't see the, the spinning. I couldn't see the, I, I couldn't see the nose and the, and the profile. All I could see was the hourglass. What happens in this, in this myth of ourselves is we feel like we're alone in life sometimes. Because other people have experiences that we don't have. I can't see white and, and gold. All I see is the black and blue. And if we're not careful, that thinking creeps into every facet of our life. Nobody sees me. I'm alone in this. Nobody gets me. Nobody understands me. Nobody is with me. Nobody's coming to help me. No one understands what I'm going through. And so there's things that we're taught in the church, but there's also things that we've been taught or experienced in our lives that just aren't true. You're not alone in this life. And we're going to unpack that today. Now, what's driven this uh, kind of this mindset into us is really since the dawn of, of the press, really, since the, the, the evolution of newspapers and then magazines and then books and self-help books and, and chicken noodle soup for the soul and then, and then social media. It's just driven into us that you are alone, that, you, that, that you're never going to, that you're never going to get it right. And what happens is, at least in my life, and maybe I'm just preaching to myself this morning on this snowy day, is confusion begins to set in. That there's so many news sources, there's so much information, there's so many stories. Who do you believe and what do you believe? And so all of a sudden, confusion settles into our souls. Let, let me give you an example of this. Ten years ago, there were two genders. At the end of 2023, there's 81. You want to talk about confusion is we're told all of these different things 10 years ago, two, 81. It's, 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 it's confusing as to what is true. We feel alone in this. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe there is 81, but I think we, we get confused. When confusion hits, there's a, there's a natural thing that happens next. It's called fear. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a, a swear word that you're not going to want to hear. Three years ago when COVID, don't shoot me, don't hit, I hate that word, it's a swear word, it's a potty word, don't use it, right? When COVID hit three years ago, almost, right? There was so much confusion and so much uncertainty it caused us to do what? Fear. Now, you, you, you guys are way better than I am. I was the person, I'll be very candid, I was the person that kept my wife and kids at home and went to the grocery store. And when I came back to the driveway, I Clorox wiped the groceries off because there was so much confusion. What's true? 50 million Americans are going to die this year from COVID. It's not going to be my family. I'm going to do everything I can to protect them. There was so much confusion with what was happening and fear. It consumed me. I'll be very candid. Now, you're all judging me because you're better than I am, but that was me. Clorox wiping my groceries. So if it was on that, I didn't bring it in. But confusion which then leads to fear, leads to a third feeling. Because if we're stuck in fear with the economy and the stocks and the inflation, and the world's ending, what happens is we become angry. This is a natural progression. When we're confused, we get afraid. And when we're afraid, it's fight or flight, right? And we're going to fight. But I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you saw anger resolve anything? In fact, Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, in your anger, don't sin. So what, what Paul is saying is there's a time for appropriate anger, but, but don't sin with it. Don't let the sun go down, because if you do, you will give the devil a foothold. There's a time for anger, but it's not out of confusion, which leads to fear and then unbridled anger. The time for anger is, is righteous anger. And Jesus modeled it, right? If, if you read the parables and, and the stories in the New Testament, there was a time where Jesus goes into the temple and the religious leaders are overcharging for, for worship, for sacrifice for worship. And he goes into the temple and he does what? He flips over the table. He, didn't, he wasn't like, hey guys, just hold your change. I'm going to tip it over real gentle, okay? Can you hold that? I don't want it to spill. He, that's, that's not how he did it. He went in and literally flipped it over. Change goes everywhere. Birds go flying. It's anger. Because it was abusing the, the religious and, and the relationship and, and the worship of God. But that's not what we're talking about when we go from confusion to fear. Because this anger is getting our way. 
And it's interesting, I see this permeating our world, our continent, our country, our state, our cities, our workplaces, our homes, and our relationships. Anger. But it was, it was bred by fear, and it was bred by confusion. So what I want to do today is I want to counteract those feelings. If you find yourself in one of those spots, whether it's confusion, fear, or anger, I want to kind of counteract those this morning. That we don't have to live in confusion. There is clarity. It's the Word of God. If, if Facebook and, and TikTok and the socials and Fox News and CNN are your only source of information, you're missing out on clarity. This is where clarity comes from. <laughs> Dust it off and read it. You will actually have clarity of mind, clarity of thinking, clarity of direction, which then leads to a confidence. A confidence in who you are, whose you are, who has you in the palm of his hands. There's a confidence that comes when we have clarity and that I have a relationship and a foundation built on Jesus. There's a confidence that comes within that. That my morals and my values, they line up with biblical morals and biblical values based on the truth of a promise of God's word, which then leads to calm. Now, that should be peace, but I'm a pastor and it has to alliterate with all C's. It's just how my brain works. I'm like, I can't put CCP. That just feels weird, sounds weird, looks weird. It's got to be a C. But calm. You, you could put peace there if you're taking notes. See, anger is counteracted with clarity, confidence, and calm. We can live with these. You can live with these. Now, listen, here's what I know. When you see somebody that has clarity, confidence, and calm, you think they're on something. How are they living like? Or you think they're up to something. And they're up to something because they're on something. You're like, yeah, there's no way you can live with clarity and confidence and calm. Not in this culture, not in this world. But wouldn't it be nice to live with these? Just a clarity of who and what you are in Jesus. And that while, yeah, inflation's going crazy and thank the Lord gas prices are coming down, but it's still expensive. Groceries are wild. We spent $86 for one bag the other day. 86 bucks for one bag of groceries. What? It's crazy. But we can have a confidence that, hey, I'll be taking care. God will take care of us, which then leads to this peace, this calmness. I just want to tell you, just let you know that that's not going to save you. Social media is not going to save you. Religion isn't going to save you. These three things are what we lean into for confidence. They're what we lean into for calm. They're what we lean into for clarity. In fact, I'll just go even far, as far to say that, that religion will actually cause more confusion. Religion will cause more fear. And religion will cause more anger. Because religion is about fear of failure, falling short, messing up. And it will drive you crazy. So I want to counteract that today from Matthew chapter 16. I want to look at what, where we find calm, where we find confidence, and where we can actually live with this peace of God that lives and flows through us. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip over to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16 is the text today. Now, what I want to do is give you some pretext to the content we're going to look at in Matthew 16. Leading up to Matthew 16, beginning with verse... Um, 13 later on, is verses 1 through 12, right? But here's what happens in this text. The Pharisees are approaching Jesus. And if you don't know what a Pharisee is, a Pharisee is a religious leader. It was somebody that had clout, that had influence in the temple, in the synagogue. And they would wear these long flowing robes and they would wear uh, purple ropes around their neck and, they, and they, they wanted to look good for the people. And what they would do is they would literally walk around and make sure people followed the laws. There were 613 laws that you had to follow. They would watch you and wait for you to mess up so they could call you out. Like the story with the woman caught in adultery that we looked at a couple weeks ago. They were watching through a window, creepers, for her to mess up. And they called her out and, and condemned her and and made her feel, and shamed her, made her feel stupid. That's what the Pharisees, that's who the Pharisees were. I just, listen, I wanted to wear a t-shirt and, and lift up this shirt underneath and just say, don't be a Pharisee. Like, don't, don't look for people to mess up. Don't just wait for people to, to fall short and then just cast judgment. Don't be a Pharisee. That, that's free. That's not part of the notes. That's just free. 
And so the Pharisees are approaching Jesus because he's getting a gathering. He's getting uh, a group of people and it's growing more and more and more because he's doing things that nobody else is doing and he's offering hope, right? And he's offering love. And so they're trying to trap him and trip him up into saying something or doing something that they can call him out on for breaking one of the 613 laws. And so it says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 4, it says, uh, they said, give us a sign. Jesus, tell us that you really are the Messiah. And this is what he says back. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given the sign except the sign of Jonah. And then Jesus left them and went away. So the religious leaders say, hey, prove to us you're the Messiah. Give us a sign. Jesus says back, Listen, I'm not going to give you a sign. The sign's already been given, the sign of Jonah, which, which is actually a referral to what he's about to go through it a little bit, which is his death, burial, and resurrection. Jonah, belly of the whale for three days. Jesus, belly of the earth, three days. That, that's kind of the, the metaphor that Jesus is showing them, that Jesus is giving them. But he says, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. I'm not going to give you one. You've already had it. Then he walked away. Can we just stop here for a second and learn from Jesus? If somebody's getting under your skin, walk away. He doesn't engage in an argument. He doesn't have to be right and prove his point and beat them down. He just says, listen, I've, you've already had your sign. And he walks away. I wonder if there's something that we could all learn from this. Because when we live with fear, which leads to anger, we have to always be right and prove our point. And we actually alienate people. And Jesus says, listen, I'm just going to tell you, You've already had your sign, and he walks away. Then he says this to the disciples. They crossed the lake. The disciples discovered that they'd forgotten to bring any bread. And he said, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is, this is such an interesting text to me. He says, guys, there, there's just watch out. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Watch out for the yeast of the Sadducees. And then the disciples answered, is this... Is this because we didn't bring any bread? These are my guys. Like, you can picture Peter and Andrew like, man, I didn't know we wanted bread. My wife made a batch this morning. Oh, game changer. I had cinnamon and some, some, some nutmeg, I think she sprinkled in there, some raisins. I mean, this thing was, um, if you would have wanted, I could have brought bread. Like, they think literally he means the yeast of the Pharisees. And they're like, who carries yeast around to make bread? But what Jesus was saying is watch out for the teachings of people who don't really follow and honor God, it will spread among you. It will grow among you. It will cause a movement among you. But if you're not careful, you're going to get led astray. Be very careful of people who say they love Jesus, but don't act and show and live out that same love that they speak about. And that's what Jesus is saying to them. Not... Is this because we, we didn't break bread? I love these guys. And I, I picture Jesus, when they say this, he's like, oh. And I'm like, you picked them. I mean, you picked this, this motley crew, right? And then he says, he goes on to tell them. He says, how, how is it that you don't understand? I'm not talking to you about bread. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then, he, then they begin to understand that he wasn't talking to them about bread, but the teachings of the Sadducees and the teachings of of the Pharisees. Now that's the backstory to what happens next. You have to know the content that's happening before the, con the, the context we're in right now, okay? You have to know the backstory. So this happens. He says, watch out, be careful. Then he, be then he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? I want to I pause here for a second and camp on this, on this verse. Anybody ever heard of Caesarea Philippi? Some of us have. Caesarea Philippi, if you're not familiar, Caesarea Philippi is a modern-day Las Vegas, right? It, it's, it's Sin City. What happens in Caesarea Philippi stayed in Caesarea, except for what happens in Sin City doesn't stay there because of technology, right, and, and, and live streaming and all that stuff. But, but you get my point. It's just, it's a, it's a bad place. In fact, Caesarea Philippi, if you read about it, would make Sin City, Las Vegas look like Disney World today. This place was vile, in fact, in Caesarea Philippi, this is what it kind of looks like modern day. But this cave right here, there's a natural spring that flows out of it. The Benias, which is a site of the Golden Heights in a natural spring, was associated and given credit to a Greek god named Pan. 
So this is what it kind of would have looked like. This, this is the, that cave that I just showed you. And they built a temple to worship a Greek god named Pan. Because there was a natural spring in the middle of the temple where there was a crack, or the middle of the cave, where there was a crack in the cave and steam would come up, mist would come up, and it flowed out this beautiful stream. And so they accredited it to a, a Greek god named Pan. Pan was believed to be born a mature child. His distinct appearance was half goat and half man. It delighted the hearts of all gods, which is why they named him Pan. Pan means all. And so in Caesarea Philippi, they worshipped a Greek god named Pan because Pan held the keys to the cave, which in that cave, in that crack of the wall where the steam came up, they believed that that was the entrance to Hades, entrance to hell, where demons would come up and demons would go back. And so in order to worship in this temple, you had to be willing and you had to be able to, This is going to be a little graphic, and I apologize, to have sexual relationship with goats. And so if you wanted to go into the temple and worship Pan, you had to engage with goats. This is what they worshipped. This is how they worshipped. This place is worse than you could ever imagine and probably even want to imagine. And Jesus goes there. I want you to understand something. The myth that you're alone, the myth that no one sees you, the myth that no one hears you, the myth that no one gets you, the myth that no one understands you is not true. That Jesus walks towards you. He doesn't walk away from messy people. I'm a mess. I just am. And he doesn't walk away from me. He walks towards me. He doesn't walk away from messy people. He walked to Caesarea Philippi. The messiest place there was. You want to know how far it was? So Jesus, you'll be able to see it on the bigger screen, but I can't reach that. All right. The main, main state right was out of Nazareth. He does most of his ministry along here. The Jordan River down to the Dead Sea. Jerusalem and Jericho are down here. This is, this is where he does the main bulk of his three years of earthly ministry. Caesarea Philippi is 25 miles to the north. You don't accidentally walk 25 miles out of the way. So he he has just warned the disciples, watch out for the what? The yeast of the Pharisees. Because their teachings, they can lead you astray. And then he walks on purpose three days to the north to go to Caesarea Philippi. This is not on accident. This is on purpose. That is so important to know as we unpack the rest of this text. So he says to them, he's now at Caesarea Philippi. Many historians and theologians' commentaries would say that he was right outside the temple of Pan. Not in, because to go in you would have to do bad things. They're outside of the temple. And he asks this question, who do do people say I am? They answered him back. Some say, the disciples said, you're no one as John the Baptist. Others have kind of referred to you as Elijah. Others have said you're like Jeremiah or, or you're just a prophet. That's, that's kind of the word on the street is that's what they say you are. I think we've let people say for far too long who Jesus is rather than the Bible reminding others of who Jesus is. I want us to get this. We've let other people say, oh, yeah, he lived. He was a good man. We've let others tell us, yeah, he lived a, he lived a good life and he had immoral teachings, but he, I mean, he wasn't the son of God. Can I just tell you, he is not a good man if he's claiming to be the son of God and he's not. He's called a liar. He's not teaching moral values because he taught what? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you're not the Messiah, that's not moral That's conceited and arrogant. So he has to be all of these or he doesn't get to be any of these. Which then leads to the question, is he one of many gods in your life or is he your only God? Meaning he is before your spouse and he is before your kids and he's before your work and he's before your finances and he's before your hobbies. Is he one of many gods or is he your one and only God? Is what this is saying. 
Either he was who he said he was or he wasn't. So who do you say I am? He says that. Who, who are others saying I am? Then he says this to the disciples. What about you? Remember where he's standing. What about you guys? Who, who do you guys say I am? You've been following me for a while, Jesus said. Who, who am I? My main squeeze, Simon Peter, speaks for. I love Simon. Peter's like, ooh, 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 teach, teach, pick me. Like, you can just picture it. Jesus is like, anybody? Bueller? Any? Like, he's looking around like, can somebody else other than Peter please speak up? And Peter's like, oh, I know the answer. Like, can I just picture it, right? Simon Peter says, you, you are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Who do others say I am? And then he makes it personal. Who do you say I am? I just want to ask you the question. You, you know who I say Jesus is, but I'm, I'm not you. Who do you say he is? Who is Jesus to you? <laughs> it's kind of like a little slow dance with Jesus. That's a, actually a, a moment right there where we could actually lean into. Who is Jesus to you? Not to your parents and not to your friends and not to your neighbors, not to your spouse. Who is he to you? Peter speaks up, you're the Messiah, which translates you're the Savior of the world. It translates you have all divinity, all power, and all authority. The significance of this statement by Peter goes unnoticed if you don't understand the whole backstory of Peter. Peter in Matthew 14 tried to walk on water, and what did he do? He sank. In Matthew chapter 6, Sorry, Matthew chapter 8, Jesus calms a storm, right? And, and they ask this question. They say, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Peter and the disciples have had an inkling of who Jesus is. But because they don't understand the whole gravity of it and the whole depth of it, they can't quite wrestle down that he's the Messiah. The one with all power, the one with all authority, the one with all. And so for, for Peter to make this statement... That you, are the, that you are the Messiah, comes from somewhere else. And Jesus tells us, Jesus said, you are right, Simon. Blessed are you. But this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You didn't come to this conclusion on your own. Because if you could have or would have, back in Matthew 14, when, when you sunk in the water, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have sank. Back in Matthew chapter 8, when you called me a man, you wouldn't have called me a man. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves are made? You, this wasn't revealed to you by your own flesh and blood. You didn't come to this conclusion on your own, Peter. This was given to you by my Father in heaven. My Father in heaven, God Almighty, put this knowledge in you. And I want to tell you, Peter, that on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Where are they standing? At the gate where they believed the demons came and went at the gates of Hades. And Jesus says, on this rock, he's not saying rock like, he's saying on this statement, on this foundational statement, Peter, that you just made, I will build my church and everything that they think they can throw at it to stop it, to derail it, will not stand against it. Uh, where he picks at the gate of a Hades to make this statement 25 miles out of his way to step towards messy people to, to make, make a, a statement, statement that the mess he is for. He will walk towards you. He will engage with you. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I want to remind you that Jesus didn't go to Rome and build the church on a political structure or with a political structure. He didn't go to Jerusalem and build the church on a religious structure or with a religious structure. He didn't go to Bethsaida and build the church on a financial structure or with a financial structure. And he didn't go to Samaria and Sychar to build a church on or with a progressive structure. Structure. He went to the messiest city with the messiest people and the messiest theologies and the messiest practices and the messiest lifestyles. He said, yep, on them I'm going to build my church. 
And if we were a clapping church, that's where you would say, thank you, Jesus, because I'm a messy. And thank you that you built your church upon a mess because you love the mess and you care about the mess and you see the mess. You're not alone in your mess. That's who we serve. That's why Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi. And he said, now I'm going to give you something, Peter. On this rock, on this statement, I will build my church. And the powers of hell, the gods that they worship, the, 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 the mist and, and the steam and the stream that comes out, nothing is going to be able to stop what I'm about to start, he says. Nothing that the enemy will throw at us is going to stop us. Listen, anything the enemy throws at you with the power of Jesus doesn't have to derail you. Anything he throws at you. Because the power of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overcome a movement of God. Then he says this in verse 19. And so Peter, upon this rock, upon this statement, I'm going to build my church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he says to the disciples, hey, just don't tell anybody yet that I'm the Messiah. Don't, don't let this slip out. I've still got some work to do. We've got to keep this on the down low. Have you ever read a verse and you're like, huh? I read this one and I go, huh? I don't, I don't, I don't quite get, what do you mean the, the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Until you dig in and understand the context of the entirety of this piece of scripture. Jesus tells Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up in a synagogue in front of thousands of people and he begins to preach Jesus. He begins to preach hope. He begins to preach good news. This is what he says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you. This promise is for your children. This is promises for all who are far off, like those in Caesarea Philippi. And with many warns, it says, with many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves. And people who accepted this message were baptized and saved that day. About 3,000 people had the keys to the kingdom of heaven unlocked because Peter was given the key to unlock their kingdom. Then a few chapters later, in Acts chapter 10, this is so crazy. Peter meets with a man in Acts chapter 10. His name is Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile. Cornelius is not like a Jew. Cornelius is, is not an enemy, but not loved. Doesn't dress like them. Doesn't think like him. Definitely doesn't pay taxes and vote and look like him, Peter. And he meets with Cornelius and he begins to have a conversation with Cornelius. And Peter began to speak and he says this, I realize now how true it is that God does not show favoritism. But he accepts every nation. He accepts every person. He accepts every race. He accepts everyone who fears him and does what's right. I just tell you that Peter unlocked the kingdom of heaven for Cornelius and a gathered group of Gentiles, and they started a church and a church movement that Paul eventually went and ministered to. Listen, here's the key. Here's the takeaway. You have the key to unlock the kingdom of heaven of somebody in your life. That you've been given the key to unlock the kingdom of heaven in somebody's life around you. So Jesus told Peter, he built his church on it. The gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not overcome it and it's still happening. That we still have the key. We still have the power and the authority from Jesus to unlock somebody's heaven. It's not the role of the pastor. It's not the role of Billy Graham and the evangelist. It's the role of the church to unlock the kingdom of heaven in people. 
And we do that by stepping towards them and not away from them. The people who look different or think different or identify different or vote different or dress different or spend different. Jesus died for all. Which means that you have somebody in your life that you've been given power and authority to have the key to unlock the kingdom of heaven in their life. It's a high responsibility, but it's kind of a cool calling that that just like he gave it to Peter, and Peter lived it out, he's given it to us, and we get to live it out. You see, in a world of confusion, we actually can live with clarity. In a world of fear, we can live with confidence of whose whose I am. I'm, I'm I'm a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're a child of the Almighty King. There's clarity and confidence that comes with that, which then just leads to this calmness that we actually have the key to unlock somebody's kingdom of heaven. So here's how I want to close. Along the altar at the front are a number of keys. Some are large, some are small, some are unique, some are standard. And yet, I look at this and go, there's somebody's heart that this unlocks, the kingdom of heaven. Somebody in my life that doesn't know Jesus, I have been given the key to unlock their kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't save them. We know that. That's Jesus and Jesus' work on the cross. But you might have a friend. You might have a neighbor. You might have a parent. You might have a, a, a mom or a dad, a grandparent, a son or a daughter that does not know Jesus And you've been given the key to unlock their kingdom of heaven. And there's a gravity, right, that comes with that. There's a weight that comes with that. But it's the confidence that we have and the clarity that we have and the calmness we have is we don't save them. Jesus does. All we do is present the key. And Jesus does the saving. There's a a guy in my life met him in 2010. We've prayed for him, kept in touch with them, ministered to them, stepped towards them, had them walk away from us, stepped towards them again. I have the key to unlock the kingdom of heaven in his life. He doesn't know Jesus. And if he were to die today, he would spend eternity apart from Jesus. And so I continue to pray for him and pray over him. And around 2021, I stopped. I stopped praying for him. I'm like, this is a lost cause. <laughs> this isn't making a difference. This isn't changing anything. All I'm doing is getting frustrated. And then God convicted me this week. Why have you stopped praying for my son? So I pick a key up. And I pray that somehow, some way, I can show him and continue to minister to him and tell him, listen, Jesus died for you and he cares about you and he doesn't want to spend eternity without you. If the loss don't break your heart, you're missing it. And I don't mean that condemningly. I mean that with confidence and clarity that our, that our goal, right, is to reach the lost, the least, and the overlooked. And you have the key to unlock someone's kingdom of heaven. Who is it in your life? Mine's a 44, 45-year-old buddy that I've known for 14 years. That for a couple I gave up on. That God said, but Dan, you have the key to unlock his kingdom. So how we're going to close is my wife and I are just going to kind of close with a response song, just a a reminder of how much Jesus loves us and we love him, that this is for him. And along the front, there are, there are keys. Again, some are large, some are small, unique ones. They don't work on anything. Don't try to open a door. Don't try to start a car. But put it on your keychain. Put it on your nightstand. Put it on your medicine cabinet. Clip it to your fridge somehow with a magnet. And every time you see that key, you just say, God, would you give me... Give me the words. Give me the timing. I don't want them to spend eternity without you. And the gates of hell will not prevail.